a uh, short little video. That's from the Carry On Classic series from, of course, the British comedy, of course, uh, in England. So, hey, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope everybody's having a great week out there. Uh, of course, getting ready for fall break. I think Thursday and Friday, of course, this week uh, will be off. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, today I'll kind of be moving on from, uh, you know, talking about British history uh, into talking about the French, the French history. Uh, of course, this week we'll talk about the French Revolution. Uh, next week I'll talk about also uh, the age of Napoleon uh, as well. So looks like we've got a few students out here watching live uh, right now. Uh, I know Lulu just joined us earlier. Good morning. Uh, and also it looks like Brit Brittany uh, also uh, has joined us as well. <clears throat> and then uh, Steph, hey, good morning. And also it's like Samaria is also joining us as well. And also Brianna and looks like Christopher as well. So uh, anyway, uh, before I get started, I, I want to go ahead and remind you about uh, important assignments, which I know will be off a few days. I know at the end of the week. Uh, but I did want to remind you about some assignments uh, that are out there. I know the one y'all should be working on right now uh, is the uh, first exam. I think I, I gave you a, a bunch of days extra to kind of wrap on, up on that by the week. And I think it's going to close Saturday. Uh, so I did give you a few more days uh, to wrap it up uh, overall. Uh, also, that bonus quiz on the uh, scientific revolution, age, age of enlightenment. I think I did push that up too, uh, which I think that one hadn't been extended yet. So I'll kind of look at that maybe into pushing that back into next week. Uh, second vocab is also due Friday. Uh, probably I'll leave that open a few days uh, during the um, fall break uh, and into, I think next week is midterms. I know that coming up. And then uh, of course, I did post uh, that new quiz uh, on the rise of the British Empire lectures. I did, of course, finish up on Monday. So that'll be due later, of course, in the month. But I, I'm not going to have, of course, a, a midterm exam next week. So uh, whatever kind of grades that are out right now, uh, if you want to try to, you know, get those completed before, before you know, midterms come along, uh, that can, you know, either, I guess, could change your grade or whatever in the class. So just, just try to get whatever you can done, uh, of course, upcoming this week and part of next week. So anyway, like I said, this week I'll, I'll be moving on to uh, kind of getting into more like in the French history, uh, which we'll kind of talk about. I'll kind of first talk about the French Revolutionary Period, which happens at the end of the 18th century. Uh, a major event, of course, not just in French history, but uh, European history as well, because it totally changes Europe, uh, especially politically. Uh, you know, French Revolution really led to a lot of reforms, democracy uh, in Europe. Uh, so I'll kind of talk about that. And then later next week, I'll kind of talk about how Napoleon comes in and kind of changes also France as well, uh, when he kind of begins the so-called age of Napoleon. So if you have any comments, like I said, questions, of course, in the live stream, you know, uh, do let me know. Uh, either during the lecture, or you can always, of course, leave me comments on my channel. Or also, you can also leave comments in the Canvas discussions also uh, as well. So uh, anyway, um, you saw the guillotine. We'll kind of get to that later. The guillotine is often a major symbol, of course, of the French Revolution, especially the tyranny that happened, I'll get to later, on the uh, reign of terror. That's when they really used it the most uh, in France. But the guillotine was actually used as a form of execution uh, up to like 1977, which is pretty amazing uh, overall. Now, I'll kind of talk about like first the background of the French Revolution. The French Revolution was a 10-year period uh, in French history where there was a lot of political and social upheaval, uh, which led to a revolution that totally changed the not just France, but later, of course, parts of Europe. Uh, it did overthrow uh, Bourbon absolutism because, uh, you know, prior to that, they didn't really have any kind of forms of democracy. Uh, they didn't really have a written constitution uh, either as well. Uh, and so that's going to later lead into France becoming uh, democratic reformed, uh, which, of course, will later lead to them adopting like a republic and things like that. 
Uh, I'll get to it later. They do have the period where it kind of gets radical uh, under the Jacobins, where the Jacobins execute a lot of people that were kind of against the revolution. So I'll kind of talk about that. And then later I will get into and discuss how Napoleon, you know, seized power uh, eventually uh, as well, which happened in 1799 uh, pretty much. Yeah, so those are the years. Of, of course, you can see the Bastille. I'll talk about that later. The Bastille is also another famous image that you often see uh, with the French Revolution. Uh, and uh, let me first talk about who was in power when the revolution broke out. Uh, you kind of see here on the left, you have Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth was the fifth Bourbon ruler of France, who was in power from 1774 to 1792. Now, he was the grandson of King Louis the Fifteenth, uh, who had reigned previously after Louis the Fourteenth had died. Uh, in 1715. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was kind of seen as this ruler that had poor leadership skills, maybe indecisive, incompetent, uh, running the country. And so I think that kind of played a role uh, possibly of why, you know, the French Revolution uh, broke out uh, in 1789. Uh, and then, of course, his wife, you see on the right, uh, was also famous uh, as well. Uh, she, of course, was the Queen of France from 1770 to 1792. Uh, she was an Austrian princess, uh, the daughter of Maria Theresa, of course, of the Austrian Empire, Austrian monarchy. Uh, and so those two kind of together ruled the country. They were kind of out of touch uh, with most of the people uh, in in France, because uh, at the at the time, you know, France was a uh, probably the largest country in Europe. About thirty million people ruled uh, was pretty much ruled by them, and most people didn't really have any political rights uh, except the upper classes uh, in France. Uh, by the way, uh, of course, uh, if you know about his wife, going kind of kind of, I think I've got more images. Uh, uh, let me first talk about how he got into power a little bit uh, before I kind of get more uh, deeply into the causes of the revolution. Uh, that man who you see there uh, in that image uh, was the father of Louis XVI. On the left, that was uh, Louis the Dauphin, uh, who uh, was really the last surviving son of Louis XV. Uh, and he was supposed to get the throne. But what happened was uh, in 1765, he died of tuberculosis at a very young age of 36. And so that's why the throne ended up going to Louis the 16th, who was, I think, a teenager when he came to power. And so he was really inexperienced with any kind of political rule. Uh, and uh, Louis uh, the Dauphin had three sons, by the way, who would later become kings of France, uh, which were uh, Louis the 16th at the top, uh, and then uh, Louis the 18th on the bottom left, and then also Charles X on the, on the bottom right that you had. Uh, but France at the time was in crisis. You know, uh, the country was still a feudal country uh, at the time. Uh, and so, the, like I said, the monarchy was really out of touch. Uh, and that, that kind of partially is what caused it. And then all kinds of other things you can see there that call, I'll get to it later, but there was a series of famines in the country. Uh, also as well. Uh, Britain had really industrialized more than France had was another issue uh, that they talk about sometimes also that caused it. And I'll get to the political social issues that were also there uh, as well. But yeah, Marie Antoinette, uh, she was often vilified uh, by a lot of the French people. Uh, the French often didn't really like her because uh, she was kind of seen as a foreigner like an Austrian princess. And then uh, she was also kind of seen as a spendthrift uh, also as well. And uh, they often gave her a lot of nasty nicknames. And of course, Madame Deficet, I think, was a common name that she was called because uh, of the fact that they kind of blamed her as a scapegoat for why France was declining uh, in the late 18th century. Uh, also, Madame Vito, I think, was another common nickname because of the fact that uh, I think when um, Louis the Sixteenth had veto power, uh, they thought she was the one that was pretty much influencing his veto. Uh, Austrian bitch or Austrian lesbian, I think, was a 
another term they used uh, also as well uh, for Marie Antoinette. Uh, they accused her of being a lesbian because the two had had problems uh, having children initially. Uh, and so uh, they thought that was a, a German vice or something like that. Uh, there's stories about also Marie, uh, Marie Antoinette. You may have heard about uh, how she supposedly said this famous remark, let them eat cake, uh, which has often been attributed to her, uh, especially with the plight of the, of the peasants. I think she was saying, um, they can't eat bread, eat brioche, which is like a type of fancy bread, uh, which is made with eggs and raisins and things like that. But they're not sure that she ever really said it. I think there's a theory that uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is the one that actually coined it uh, in his autobiography, uh, which was called The Confessions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And it kind of kind of got connected to her later uh, after the revolution started. Uh, let me talk about a few other things that were also, they consider like another cause of the French Revolution uh, was the Little Ice Age, uh, which was more of a uh, issue that uh, was, um, they think it was some kind of climatic issue uh, that helped to cause the revolution. They think during uh, Europe, uh, and I think mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, there was a case where there was a kind of a cooling period uh, where it caused like bad harvests, uh, famines, uh, food shortages, uh, especially in France. Uh, it was a major issue. And uh, there was a man named uh, Francois Mathis, uh, who was the one uh, that coined it. He was an American geologist in the 1930s. And uh, he's the one that basically originally called it that, uh, like the little ice age. And so uh, they think that was a major issue. Uh, help cause it. And they think that what happened was the medieval warm period, which had existed, at, I think, at the end of the Middle Ages, kind of ended. And it was a cooling period uh, that occurred uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere, which there's been different theories on why it happened. I think one theory uh, was that it was caused by less sunlight uh, from the sun, which I, I think one theory I've heard is that there was a, several volcanic eruptions, especially in Iceland, and that helped to contribute to why the it got cooler. And since then, you can see it's kind of warmed up, which a lot of that's been caused by the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there are images you may have seen, too, paintings where, like, in, I think in England, I think it was, uh, the Thames River, like, froze over on uh, things like that. And those are things that were kind of famous that occurred uh, during the uh, Little Ice Age. Uh, now, an, another issue that they say caused, they think, the French Revolution was the Seven Years' War uh, that happened. Uh, the Seven Years' War was a major world war that, that occurred between 1756 uh, to 1763. Uh, and uh, if you go to this map right here, uh, you can see it was caused by uh, new alliances that formed uh, in Europe, uh, which... Um, Prussia is one of the major countries that helped start it, along with uh, the British Empire that was kind of forming in the 18th century. And um, the diplomatic revolution, if you remember correctly, was this alliance uh, that was formed where Britain allied with Prussia uh, and also Hanover, uh, along with, by the way, Portugal uh, as well. And France and Austria kind of joined forces together. And that brought in other countries like Spain. Uh, Russia, Sweden. And so uh, the whole balance of power in Europe kind of changed at that point. Uh, and so uh, that was dubbed the so-called diplomatic revolution. And that's why um, uh, Marie Antoinette ended up marrying into the French Bourbons, uh, et cetera. Uh, here's kind of a world map showing you where all the conflicts took place. But uh, Obviously, in North America was one major area uh, that was considered a cause of why the French, Rev why the uh, Seven Years' War happened. Uh, fighting in Canada, uh, Great Lakes, Ohio River Valley, East Coast of Canada, uh, et cetera. Uh, Central Eastern Europe and also India uh, were major areas where they predominantly fought uh, in this war. 
Uh, the, the big part of the war was the French and Indian War, uh, which you see there, uh, which they think was, you know, pretty much fought between Britain and France and their Indian allies. Uh, and um, they fought mostly, like I said, for control of the Great Lakes, Canada, uh, Ohio River Valley. Uh, and uh, they think that the actual conflict started in western Pennsylvania, uh, close to where the Great Lakes is, because uh, uh, the French had been building forts and trying to control land in, in what they call New France that went down into Louisiana. And then you got, you look at that map there, the British were in pretty much on the eastern coast from Nova Scotia uh, all the way down uh, into Virginia, down to Georgia, uh, where, the, where the British American colonies were. Uh, and so um, at first the French weren't, uh, the French were actually successful in trying to prevent the British from really uh, expanding more into eastern Canada, but eventually what occurred was that the British put more forces into taking over Canada. And uh, if you go back to that map right there, one of the most strategic battles uh, in the French and Indian War uh, was over the fortress Louisburg, uh, which is up at the top right. Uh, Louisburg uh, was an important fortress that controlled the uh, St. Lawrence River Valley and its gulf. Uh, and so when, when the British took that, that enabled uh, the British to go down uh, the St. Lawrence River Valley into eastern Canada, where they could then attack the main capital of Quebec, which is you know, the capital of New France uh, at the time. And so the, the British were able to get enough forces into uh, Quebec uh, and take the city, which they did, by the way, uh, in September of 1759 is when they, I think September 13th uh, is the famous date. Uh, the so-called, uh, I think it's dubbed the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, uh, which um, is considered, I guess, the most important battle in the whole Seven Years' War, uh, especially in the French and Indian War. And so with the fall of Quebec uh, to the British, that, that totally changed the whole world afterwards because uh, from there and from there the british you know take start taking over a lot of territory from the french and begin taking over of course uh pretty much the world the, the british empire is going to expand after that uh afterwards they have the treaty of paris was signed in 1763 what happened was the french then was forced to cede canada to the british they took over all of that and in Britain, uh, what happened was Britain traded uh, Louisiana, uh, which was had been originally controlled by the Spanish. They gave it, uh, they gave it to Spain uh, because the British wanted Florida, uh, and so that that enabled the whole British to control all of the eastern part of the United, where the United States will be later, uh, to the Mississippi River, and then along with Canada. Uh, another major cause, of course, also of the of the French Revolution, uh, was the American was was the American Revolutionary War, which is you know called different names: a War for American Independence, etc. Uh, also, as well, and um, a lot of it was because of the fact that the French inquired a lot of uh, high debts from the war, trying to go get back at the British uh, after the Seven Years' War. Uh, and a lot of the causes of it was the fact that the, between the British 13 colonies uh, and Parliament and the British government back in London, uh, there was kind of a conflict over a lot of taxation and political issues. And a lot of, a lot of Americans in the British colonies uh, there on the eastern seaboard felt like they didn't really have any representation, uh, of course. Uh, and so that's part of why. Eventually, they broke away uh, in the American Revolution that started in 1775. Uh, of course, later, uh, what will happen is because of the fact that in July 4th, 1776, you know, it's the famous date when they would declare independence, the United States, uh, what would have happened was the French would decide to give them economic and military aid. So that's something they started doing. Uh, by I think 1777 is when the French really start openly trying to support the United States uh, against the British. 
And so they uh, directly supported uh, the Continental Army, which was the main colonial army that fought against the British, uh, headed up by George Washington, who later was, you know, the first president of the United States uh, after the war. Uh, and so that that's going to be vital later in really changing the course of history. But in a sense, you know, basically indirectly causing the French Revolution in the future. Here's George Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, the revolution would go on to 1783. Uh, part of why uh, the Americans won that war was because of French military support, where uh, they bottled up uh, the British forces uh, using the French Navy uh, in eastern Virginia, so-called Siege of Yorktown. On uh, October 1781 was really the biggest turning point battle of the whole war. Uh, and so you had a lot of um, Frenchmen that went over there uh, and fought on the American side. You may have heard of uh, Marquis de Lafayette, I think was a famous French soldier that was involved in the American Revolution under Washington, who was actually later involved in the French Revolution uh, at the beginning uh, as well. Uh, Comte de Rochambeau, you may have heard of him. Uh, was also a famous uh, soldier who was involved in Admiral Francois Joseph de Grasse, I think was another uh, famous soldier who was an admiral of theirs that was also involved in the war as well. Now, of course, there's the uh, Treaty of Paris in 1783 that would actually create the United States. Uh, and so because of French help, you know, the United States was able to break away uh, from the British, but the French ended up, you know, about it getting really a revolution instead because uh, the French were, like I said, heavily influenced by what happened uh, with the American Revolution. Now, I'm going to talk about how the revolution broke out uh, in, in 1789. Uh, one of the biggest causes of what led to the French Revolution occurring was the uh, unequal status of the so-called of the so-called ancient regime, uh, which the ancient regime uh, was what they called the uh, French uh, uh, political social system that they had uh, in the country. I'll kind of blow it up here, but it was kind of like a pyramid scheme uh, of different social classes uh, that were part of France at the time, which they had three. They had the first estate, uh, the second estate, uh, and they had the third estate. Uh, you can see the first estate was the clergy that was in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the second estate was the nobility, uh, which both those had a lot of power uh, to control, like the land. Uh, they had all of the, pretty much they had all of the uh, power, the, the rights and privileges uh, as, as the upper classes. And most of them did not pay a whole lot of taxes uh, compared to the uh, lower class. You can see that the nobility made up maybe about 2% of the actual population. I told you France was almost 30 billion people, of course, at the time. Uh, then on the bottom, you have what they call the third estate. The third estate was the common people, uh, and it was broken up into three sub subclasses. Uh, the bourgeoisie uh, was what they call the upper middle class uh, which was, by the way, sometimes referred to as the culottes because they would wear these um, uh, knee breeches uh, that came up to like around where the knees are or above it. And um, and then they had the uh, urban lower lower classes were like the towns, people or city workers that were kind of like a lower middle class uh, that you had. And they were often called sans culottes, without culottes. Uh, and so they were not as wealthy. A lot of them tend to be uh, either in blue collar type working conditions uh, or maybe had some kind of uh, like a skill uh, they had. Uh, so, uh, and then of course on the bottom, you had also uh, the, the so-called peasants, which made up 80% of the French population. Uh, and uh, they predominantly worked in agriculture because, you know, France at the time was pretty much still subsisting as an agricultural state. And so they wanted mostly things like food. Uh, when, when there was like a famine because like a little ice age, you, you get a lot of these people rioting uh, for cheaper food or just food at all. They wanted lower taxes. They wanted to end feudalism and things like that. 
I mean, so they, they were they were the ones that kind of got violent uh, in the revolution. But they say that the first two, uh, the bourgeoisie on uh, the urban lower classes, uh, they were the ones that really were in, directly in the revolution that caused it because they really they really wanted to have more rights than than any group uh, than anything. I'm going to get into the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and there was a man named Abby Siez, who you see here. They think he was the one uh, that really, uh, they think that caused the revolution to break out uh, eventually. Uh, they think that the revolution, like I said, was caused by the fact that France owed a lot of debts, uh, which was primarily caused by the American Revolution. Uh, in fact, they say that the amount of debts that the French owed uh, was something like close to a billion dollars today. Uh, and so uh, what happened was it forced the uh, king, Louis XVI, to call for what they call the Estates General uh, to basically raise revenue uh, to avoid impending bankruptcy uh, to, to the country itself. Uh, and I'll kind of come back to Abby Sias uh, in a second, but uh, what's going to happen is, um, what's going to happen in the country? Uh, it's going to it's going to force eventually the, the people to kind of form their own assembly to make real reforms uh, to the country uh, overall. And um, they had this thing that was called the um, Estates General, uh, and what it was, uh, it was basically France's um, parliament system. Uh, which went back to medieval times. And it was usually called the Assembly of the Three Estates or the Estates of the Realm, I think was another nickname that they called it as well. And um, it was developed under the Valois dynasty. And it, primarily it wasn't like a real assembly like parliament was in England. And predominantly it was mostly an advisory body to the king. So it didn't really have any real authority to create laws or taxation and things like that. And it actually had been closed because of the um, development of absolutism under the Bourbons back in 1614. Uh, and so what happened was in the spring of 1789, uh, 1,200 delegates were elected to this parliament, and they started meeting at Versailles. Uh, and uh, apparently what caused the whole revolution to, to blow up, if you know about it, was the assembly, the states general, couldn't decide on how they should vote. Uh, and so uh, pretty much, if you know about the whole states general, uh, the, two, the two estates, uh, the first estate uh, and the second estate, uh, had all the power, and they could just outvote the third estate is what they could do. That's pretty much what Louis XVI wanted and his advisors. Uh, then what happened was Abby Siez, if you study here, Abby Siez was this uh, Catholic priest uh, that uh, eventually um, eventually came up with this uh, manifesto that you see there, which is called What is the Third Estate? And um, it was published, they think, uh, I think it first came out in January, but by the spring it became like real, real popular in the country. Uh, and uh, his real name is Emmanuel Siez, but he's really considered one of the first French revolutionaries that kind of changes the whole outcome of what happens in France at that point in 1789. And uh, Siez didn't just go after, you know, the monarch or anything like that. He went after also uh, pretty much the upper classes and said that they had too much power. Uh, they had too much privilege and things like that. They had all the rights. And so he thought that what ought to happen is that the third estate ought to basically form its own assembly that would represent all the French people. Uh, and so that's basically uh, what eventually happens. And this manifesto, in a sense, is what helps to cause the political ramifications of, of the revolution. Uh, that's kind of what it said. I think it asked like three questions, like what is the third estate? It said everything. Uh, what has it been? up to in a political order, nothing. What does it demand to become something? Uh, and so that's, that's in a sense, what would uh, create the National Assembly, uh, which would actually be formed in uh, mid-June, June 17th, 1789, uh, which 
Uh, it has different names. I think the common name that we'll call the National Assembly is the National Constituent Assembly, but later on they shortened it to National Assembly. Um, now, another thing happened, too, with it. Uh, apparently, the king tried to lock them out of their main meeting room, and so they went and they met in this nearby tennis court uh, at Versailles. And they, at that point, what happened was all the delegates that joined it at that point decided that they would take an oath to basically create a constitution uh, for, the, for France. Uh, and so a lot of people kind of see this as the whole beginning of the political aspect of, of the revolution starting at that point uh, in the country. And uh, they, they actually, uh, there's an actual painting that's been done of that, of course, by Jacques Louis David. He's a very famous uh, uh, artist in the late uh, 18th, early 19th century. He's also famous for painting Napoleon, you know about it. And uh, anyway, that, that actual um, painting depicts all of these delegates taking an oath at that point. And the guy that's kind of in that, uh, you can see kind of that priest garb uh, in white on the, on the kind of on the left on the center, uh, that's Abby C.S. kind of taking the oath, of course, with them. Uh, that's the actual oath uh, you can see of uh, an actual assembly considering that it has been summoned to establish the Constitution of the Kingdom decrees that all members of this assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath not to separate until the Constitution of the Kingdom is established on firm foundations. Well, and so, in a sense, that basically ends really absolutism at that point when they actually do that. Uh, now, the other thing that happened, too, that really helped start the revolution is, as you know, the French citizens stormed the Bastille, uh, which happens in the next month, uh, in July of 1789. And uh, there was a talk of maybe the king closing the actual National Assembly down. Uh, and so uh, if you know about the Bastille, the Bastille uh, was a French political prison and armory uh, that was uh, in, in Paris. It had a lot of weapons in it that they could use against the regime, uh, but it was also a symbol of tyranny, you know, of, of the Bourbon uh, government that was in power. And so they heard rumors that they were going to basically be a coup and they were going to, you know, end the revolution at that point. Uh, and so all, all the people basically went toward the Bastille. And uh, there was a rumor that went out where the actual finance minister uh, under Louis the Sixteenth, named Jacques Necker, had been fired. He was a Swiss uh, French banker, and I think he had been one of the very few men that actually had wanted to, I think, make some reforms, like especially with taxation, where they were going to put maybe more taxes on the upper classes. Uh, they fired him, and I think some people thought that Marie Antoinette was behind the firing of him, and so they think that was maybe one of the main reasons why they stormed at that point. They have made a lot of paintings, of course, uh, of, of the Bastille, uh, which I think that one might be one of the most famous ones uh, that they've done. And apparently there were about 114 French guards, some of them French, some of them Swiss guards uh, that were guarding it. And uh, the people stormed it and overwhelmed the actual soldiers that were guarding it. I think only like seven people were actually in it in prison uh, when they did storm it. But apparently the actual commander that, that guarded it, his name was Marquis de Launay, he was massacred uh, at the beginning. Uh, and so he was the first one to really die uh, in, in, in the actual revolution. Uh, now, if you study about the revolution later, later they would kind of commemorate a famous day you probably heard of, which is Bastille Day, uh, which eventually was commemorated later. Uh, I think in 1880 by this uh, politician, French politician named Benjamin Raspail. And so he's one who kind of came up with the idea uh, for, for Bastille Day, which Bastille Day is a national celebration day of the French, uh, where they kind of celebrate the overthrow of uh, not just absolutism, but also the unity of the French people. And so uh, they have like, you know, military parades, fireworks, uh, things like that that they celebrate. And it's kind of like, kind of 
comparable to maybe our 4th of July uh, in the United States. Now, I'll kind of get into the beginning of the French Revolution because the French Revolution is going to get kind of different stages. It's going to kind of be moderate stage, uh, and then they kind of have radical stages that it kind of goes through uh, overall. Uh, there is one stage at the beginning uh, which is famous, uh, which I can kind of show here, but it's called the Great Fear, uh, which you can see there. Uh, the Great Fear, or Grand Pur, as I also call it as well, happened mostly around the summer, fall of 1789. Uh, and that was where what happened was the actual revolution spread from like Paris, Versailles, and it went all throughout the country. And you even had a case where the peasants got involved directly forming like mobs and things like that. And so mass hysteria, panic, you know, goes across the country uh, uh, pretty much in France. And a lot, of the, a lot of the nobility even flee the country at that point. You can see how it kind of spreads everywhere, all over the place. Uh, and um, one of the things that happens, which is real, real famous, uh, I think at the beginning of the revolution, there's a case where women get that are in Paris are kind of angry because uh, the bread prices are kind of real high. Uh, there's shortages of food. Uh, and so they actually, they actually uh, march on Versailles uh, in early October of 1789. They actually break into the palace of Versailles uh, and they force the king and queen to live in Paris. Uh, they actually practically take them back at that point. And so after 1789, uh, no monarch of France rules uh, from the Palace of Versailles anymore. And it was kind of macrobie, too, because like some of the actual guards who were guarding uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette were actually they, got, they cut their heads off. They put them on pikes. And that's something you start to see a lot uh, in in the French Revolution. Uh, then what happens is uh, the National Assembly starts making a bunch of reforms, which uh, the biggest things they did at first was the so-called August Decrees uh, that came out in August 1789. And what it did was it, it took away privileges uh, of the nobility. Uh, they got rid of serfdom. They abolished feudalism. Uh, church tithes were even abolished because I'll get to it later. Uh, they'll even get rid of the church. They'll close down the Roman Catholic Church uh, in France. And everybody was declared equal as what they call afterwards citizens, which was kind of equivalent to like, kind of like comrade, uh, in a sense. Uh, you can see there a big thing that happened too uh, in August of 1789 uh, was they adopted the so-called Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, uh, which what that did was it gave all male citizens equal rights uh, throughout the country uh, it did not include women at first, if you know about, you know, the 18th century, uh, et cetera. But you can see they gave like rights such as the right to liberty, uh, the right to property, security, resistance to oppression uh, as well. Uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech and things like that were also uh, other things that they uh, adopted to uh, at the beginning of the revolution. And later on, uh, you know about the Declaration of the Rights of Man and, and the Citizen, it becomes a preamble to a lot of uh, France's constitutions, which they do have a lot of them that they've had uh, over time. So yeah, August 26, that's the date supposedly when they adopted uh, the uh, Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen. Uh, there, there's kind of a debate about who wrote it, but they seem to think it was drafted up by Abby Siez, who I've talked about before and Marquis de Lafayette, who I discussed before, had been a famous French general uh, that fought uh, in the American Revolution. He was kind of involved in the beginning of the revolution. Uh, they do think they were consulted by Thomas Jefferson, uh, who had wrote the Declaration of Independence, uh, when the United States declared independence from Britain. And um, Jefferson at the time was an ambassador uh, to France. Uh, from America. And so they think he contributed a lot to what went into uh, the actual Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Uh, other things they did too, uh, if you know about it, uh, the French adopted a new flag, uh, which is the 
tricolor, uh, as they call it, the French flag, uh, which, by the way, represented uh, liberty, uh, equality, uh, fraternity, which, by the way, was the motto uh, of, of the French Revolution uh, overall. And then later, uh, one of the things that happened, too, that's famous during the French Revolution, they even wrote a new national anthem, uh, the Marseillaise, uh, which I'll play a clip of it later at the end before we go. Uh, but that was another thing that they started making reforms where they changed a lot of things from the original kingdom of France, because France over time is going to go to a republic, uh, which they are still, of course, today. Now, I'm going to get also into it as well. One thing that is going to happen, which is uh, very true, uh, is the fact that eventually uh, the, France is going to become also very radical uh, overall. Uh, and um, there's going to there's, there's gonna be a case where uh, what's going to happen is the French will get taken over by this group called the Jacobins, who uh, were kind of a left-wing uh, political party uh, that was in France. And uh, as this was all, before this was kind of going on uh, at that time, France did adopt a new actual uh, constitution, which eventually was finalized in 1791. Uh, which they created an assembly, which was called the Legislative Assembly, which was a unicameral type parliament. And uh, the king had limited powers. He had like what they call a suspension veto. And that's why he got in trouble later, if you know about it, Louis XVI, because when he would kind of veto legislation or bills uh, toward the revolution, uh, they would joke that, uh, you know, Marie Antoinette was Madame Vito, uh, that kind of deal. Um, so yeah, you would often do that. And of course, what happened, the story about Louis the 16th and what really propelled them eventually towards a Republic uh, at that point, uh, is, uh, Louis the 16th decided to flee the country. So the summer of 1791, uh, he got his wife and his children together. And they tried to flee to the Austrian Netherlands, uh, so-called flight to Varennes, as they call it sometimes. And they were caught halfway there, the border. Uh, and so after that, what occurred was that Louis XVI, his wife and family, weren't trusted anymore. Uh, and so they were kind of seen as traitors to the revolution. They were actually imprisoned in this palace called the Tuileries Palace. That's where they lived uh, toward the end of the actual their lives, before they were later executed uh, and all that. Uh, but the Jacobins, like I said, would take over the country uh, they think sometime by maybe 1792 uh, overall. Uh, they really weren't a political party, more like a bunch of political factions. Uh, they were kind of left wing uh, in the country. Uh, they really called the Jacobin Club uh, in France. Kind of kind of expand that right there. But uh, the Jacobins um, were led by this man named Maximilian Robespierre, who we'll talk a little bit today about. And uh, they had different political factions that were part of it. They had one that was called the Girondists, who were kind of like moderate. And then the one that was more notorious was the Montanards, or the Mountain Men, or Mountains, they're called for short. And they were kind of left wing. And Maximilian was their main political leader. He was a lawyer uh, and later dictator that took over the country. And uh, he'll later start the so-called Reign of Terror, where they began executing a lot of people that were against the revolution. Uh, and um, he was later dubbed the incorruptible, supposedly because he couldn't be corrupted, uh, Robespierre. And he'll make a lot of radical changes to the country, which really lead to the Reign of Terror and actually elimination at one point of a lot of things like even the Catholic Church. He could actually get rid of it, uh, which is really radical uh, for that time. Uh, of course, one of the things that they introduced, I'll come back to that later in a second, but one thing they really introduced uh, at that time, uh, by the way, uh, in, in France, uh, is the um, so-called guillotine uh, that you see right there, uh, the guillotine. The guillotine was a very famous symbol, uh, not just of the reign of terror, uh, but of the revolution itself. And uh, it was used a lot. Uh, in France to execute people that were against against the revolution. And uh, if you look at this picture here, um, the man on the right was the actual inventor of the guillotine. 
Cosma. His name was Antoine Louis, and he was actually the personal physician of Louis XVI, and he was told to kind of create this new execution machine uh, that would be more humane. Because uh, prior to that, you know, if you were executed, you were executed with usually hanging, uh, you know, drawn and quartered, burned at a stake. Uh, and so this new kind of method would give people equality uh, in, in execution. And uh, they think it was influenced by this uh, German version called uh, Das Fall Bell, which mean, I think means the falling axe in German. Uh, and so they think that's where it kind of evolved from. Uh, over time. And the Germans used it too up to the time of like Adolf Hitler. They're using kind of uh, kind of smaller versions that actually were inside of a room uh, that were used. Uh, here's some uh, interesting facts about the guillotine. It, was, it had all kinds of nicknames. I think they call it sometimes the Madame guillotine or a lot of people called it the national razor because uh, it was kind of seen as the main form of execution uh, for everybody, no matter what their social standing is. And uh, they do think it was first developed by 1792. Uh, they first used it on prisoners. Uh, and, um, and you can see it was used up to almost two centuries. The last time it was actually used was in 1977 uh, to kind of give you an idea of how long the French used it uh, today. Uh, it was named for one of its biggest supporters, uh, his name was Dr. Joseph. It's usually either guillotine or guillotine, uh, how they say his name, uh, who was a delegate to the National Assembly. But he was kind of considered one of the ones that wanted to implement, implement the use of it. And uh, they thought of the other names for it. Uh, besides Madame Guillotine or the National Razor, uh, they did try to name it after Antoine Louis. But I think the reason why they didn't was because it was too similar to Louis XVI's name. Uh, you can see some stats on it. It was pretty heavy. So a guillotine uh, weighed almost 1,300 pounds. Uh, the blade itself uh, weighed about almost 90 pounds. So you can imagine that thing coming on the back of your, your neck as it came down. Uh, the high of the side posts were about 14 feet, uh, and then the blade drop was about 90 inches. Uh, it fell at a rate. The blade itself fell at a rate. Of 21 feet per second. So it's very, very quick uh, as it would come down and cut your head off. And the power impact was 888 pounds per square inch to kind of give you an idea of, of the use of the guillotine. Uh, there were a lot of famous people that were executed by it too, uh, also as well. I'll get to uh, in a second. Uh, you may have heard the story about the death of Marat. Uh, Marat uh, was a famous martyr of the Jacobins uh, who was later killed uh, during the revolution. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, he had this paper that he was the editor of, which was called The Friend of the People. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, it was very, uh, a lot of his quotes were kind of famous. Like he had one quote where he would say stuff like, in order to ensure public tranquility like peace, 200,000 heads must be cut off. So. Uh, they had all these people throughout the country uh, that the Jacobins started massacring because uh, they were kind of kind of seen as counter-revolutionaries. They were kind of trying to stop the whole you know revolution in the country, all the radical changes that they were trying to do. And so they started using the guillotine. And so you can see that maybe 40,000 may have been killed uh, at one point. There's even cases where they killed people in prison too uh, without even executing them and things like that. Uh, they had this woman named Charlotte Corday that apparently stabbed him and killed and killed um, uh, uh, Jacques Louis uh, Jacques Louis David later made a painting of, of the death of Marat that can, became well well known, uh, and so um, she was of course one of some of the famous people that were executed by via guillotine. So not just men, women you know were executed also via uh, the guillotine, which. Uh, the most famous that was executed uh, was, was Marie Antoinette. Uh, she was executed uh, on October 1793. Uh, her husband had also been executed right before that as well, uh, January of 1793. So uh, those two uh, both get executed 
uh, during the during the beginning of the French Revolution at that point. Uh, and then Maximilian Robespierre, I think he's another one that they considered too also that was later executed uh, also uh, as well. But I think they say hers is the most famous because of the fact that uh, Marie Antoinette was later put on trial after her husband, Louis the Sixteenth was executed. And a lot of people thought it was just like injustice what happened to her. Uh, she was kind of seen as the scapegoat that really had nothing to do with the revolution. Uh, and so uh, her death was kind of seen like a, like a tragic thing uh, that occurred. Uh, there's a famous story where uh, when she went to get executed, uh, she accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot and she said something like, pardon, I didn't do it on purpose, uh, which I suppose was her last, last words. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about also uh, some other things that happened as well. The Reign of Terror, uh, which kind of peaked between about 1793 uh, to 94, uh, led to a lot of radical changes in the country. And some of the things they did were kind of insane, like they got rid of Christianity. They actually abolished it, uh, where uh, they wouldn't have any Christian religions or anything like that that could be practiced uh, throughout the country. Uh, and so they were replaced. They replaced Catholicism with like a deist cult, which was called the uh, cult of the supreme being. I think was actually what they called it. And every summer they would have a festival that was called the Festival of the Supreme Being. And uh, they think that uh, it developed from deist theories, which were a form of religion that was popular in the Enlightenment. Uh, and so these were ideas that that you know were adopted and actually were around and used up to the time of um, Napoleon, like in the early 1800s. Uh, anything to do with the nobility, the monarchy, statues of, of monarchs or anybody, nobility, they tried to eliminate anything, any kind of symbols of it. Uh, kind of like now they're kind of tearing down statues of like famous historical people and things like that. They did that same thing uh, in the French Revolution. I think it was a case where they took like face cards, like the king, queen, joker type cards, and they couldn't they couldn't use those because uh, it represented like nobility and monarchy and things like that uh, also as well. Uh, they also had this thing called the French Republican counter. I think they say that was the other most famous radical thing that the Jacobins did uh, with Max, Maximilian Robespierre. Uh, what happened was uh, they basically wanted to get rid of the Republican calendar uh, because it was too much in, they, they wanted to get rid of the calendar because um, it was too much in, in connected to like Christianity, like the Catholic faith, holidays, uh, saints, saints days and things like that. And so that was the reason for why they, it was an anti-Christian calendar that was more based off of like science and things like that. Uh, and so um, you can see what they did was they started over. So starting in 1792, they started with year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. Uh, and they used it up to like 1806, uh, this actual calendar. Uh, they even changed the dates uh, in all that. Uh, if you know what happened, uh, the, the calendar itself was used up to the time of Napoleon when he got rid of it in 1806 uh, overall. But they would use Roman numerals instead of actual like years, uh, you can see there. And then the other thing they did, too, which is really bizarre, uh, was they changed all the months. And uh, all the months were based off of seasons, uh, depending on the weather, uh, et cetera. And uh, they would get rid of like having like a seven-day week. Uh, you would have a 10-day week instead, where there were three weeks in a month, uh, which is really strange. Still a 24-hour day, but, you know, just 10 days, 10 days a week instead of seven is what it would be. Uh, so those are all the months they had, like Vendemare, uh, Brumare, Freemare, Nevos, Pluvos, Ventos, Germinal, Florial, Prairial, Mesador, Thermidor, and Fructidor. Uh, so I think the British made fun of it. If you know about the story about this, the French would just would sit there and call it wheezy, sneezy, freezy, slippy, drippy, nippy, showery, flowery, and bowery, hoppy, croppy, and poppy. 
because, uh, you know, uh, it was kind of ridiculous uh, based off of like the seasons, like whether it's raining or snowing, uh, it's flowering or harvest or heat. I think like Thermidor heat month because it's like real hot and things like that. Or Brumaire, it's foggy, you know, in, in France. And so they got fog month, I guess. Uh, now, I'm going to talk also more about, I'll kind of go back up here for a few minutes. Uh, I'll kind of discuss uh, what happened uh, with uh, Robespierre. Robespierre, uh, a little bit about him. He had this committee uh, that he developed. Uh, which is kind of famous uh, during the revolution, which was called the Committee of Public Safety. And they kind of suspended the Constitution, is what they did in France. And it was like this provisional government that was run by a 12-man committee. And they're the ones that basically, you know, turned France into a dictatorship uh, and made all these radical reforms. And so it led to a lot of, you know, wave of political repression in the country where they, you know, eliminate anybody or imprison anybody uh, that was pretty much uh, against the revolution. They even killed priests, uh, if you know about this uh, as well. Not just executing them, but they even in prison, they just went in there and just killed them all, uh, is what they, they basically did. So his, his, his uh, changes were really radical, what he was trying to do to the country. And eventually it went too far, uh, is what really happened. Uh, in, in the end, uh, in uh, the Girondists, who were more moderate from the, the, the Montanards or the mountain, they basically overthrew them. Uh, and Maximilian and a bunch of his uh, fellow, fellow Montanards, the radical Jacobins, were all executed uh, in a coup, uh, which became known as either the Thermidorian reaction, some people called it, or some people also call it the Thermidorian revolution. But was kind of seen as a revolution uh, within a revolution. And so moderates seized control of the government at that point, and they started instigating this thing called the so-called white terror, first white terror in 1795, where anybody that supported the Jacobins was thrown in prison or killed, uh, and including Napoleon. If you know the story about Napoleon, Napoleon had actually supported the Jacobins uh, initially, and he actually was in prison for a while uh, because of this. So what happens is, so the French government changes afterwards. So they had this, you know, committee that was running the country, Committee of Public Safety. Uh, and uh, they start having, they get this new constitution that'll come in after uh, Robespierre, he, uh, you can see there is actually executed, uh, which he will be uh, in July of 1794. And uh, the directory was a uh, new kind of government uh, that would run the state uh, from 1795 uh, to 1799. Uh, and um, the French had gone to republic in 1792, the so-called First French Republic, as they called it. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, what happened was... Um, at the time, France was fighting the so-called French Revolutionary Wars against the other powers in Europe. And uh, you'll see this new government kind of continues the revolution uh, in two, in, until 1799. But what's going to happen, I'll get to it later, Napoleon is going to seize power. He's going to become one of their best generals uh, by the end of the 18th century. And because of his, uh, I guess, famous status, uh, as a great general uh, of the French, it enables him to eventually seize control uh, of the country itself. Of course, Napoleon's not Napoleon Dynapine. That's another guy you may have heard of, by the way. But now the French government itself, uh, the reason why it was called the Directory Government uh, was because it was run by this five, uh, a five it was kind of like a five uh, executive committee of directors, they were called. And so hence the term direct directory was used later to uh, describe. So kind of like five heads of state ran the government uh, is what occurred. And it had a bicameral legislative body, uh, which had two houses uh, that it had, uh, upper, uh, a lower and upper house. Uh, there was one called the Council of 500, and then there was another one called the Council of Ancients uh, that ran it. Uh, the lower house had 500 members where they would propose the actual laws of the country, and the upper house would vote on the laws. And then 
Also, two-thirds of the legislature would initially be filled by the members of the convention, which the convention was like one of their main assemblies that they developed before that uh, convention, I guess parliament or whatever they called it sometimes. And uh, predominantly, Girondists were the ones that kind of took it over and created this new government uh, that would stay in power at that time. And uh, they would start giving people like more like right to vote, like suffrage throughout the country. It's one of the big reforms they'll start doing uh, between the period of the French Revolution and, of course, later Napoleon at the half. Uh, the guy on the left, uh, he was one of the main executive leaders uh, of the directory regime, uh, Paul Barat. Uh, he's kind of an important figure because uh, he's the one that kind of uh, allowed Napoleon to rise to power uh, as a general uh, during the so-called French Revolutionary Wars that happened in the late late 18th century. Uh, and um, he's the one that kind of gave him his early commissions as a general, and so that's part of why he was able to eventually rise to power. But uh, the only thing about the directory government, it was a weak government. Uh, Napoleon, who was winning a lot of battles uh, against coalitions that were fighting against France uh, in the French Revolutionary Wars, We'll talk about that later. It's going to allow him to seize control of the country uh, in 1799 in a coup d'etat. Uh, and so uh, that's going to lead into a new period where uh, the revolution will eventually end uh, in 1799 uh, with Napoleon uh, taking over. And of course, you got this new period that comes in, uh, which is often nicknamed uh, the so called Age of Napoleon. So Napoleon's going to emerge at the end of the 18th century uh, to take over the country. Uh, and um, anyway, um, he's going he's gonna to take over the country. And eventually, uh, Napoleon uh, is going to develop an empire, the so-called Napoleonic Empire, uh, also nicknamed sometimes the First French Empire uh, as well. Uh, and... Um, We'll talk about that, of course, next week. I'll kind of get more into, uh, you know, the rise of Napoleon at the end of the French Revolution, because I'll kind of go back and, I guess, talk about the French Revolutionary Wars uh, that are kind of breaking out uh, in the 1790s uh, at the time. But his empire is going to be quite vast. You know, Napoleon, I think Hitler, uh, those two uh, will control, control a lot of vast land uh, throughout Europe uh, at one point. Uh, and uh, he, he does kind of help to, you know, uh, change the, the, the landscape of Europe uh, politically uh, later. So I'll, I'll get to that later uh, and talk about Napoleon in like in week nine, you know, coming up. Uh, before I go today, I want to remind you all about a few things. Don't forget Thursday and Friday, uh, we're, we're basically, we have fall break, so no classes scheduled if you have a class on uh, Thursday. Uh, or Friday. Uh, also, don't forget, I do have assignments which are still out uh, also as well. I know the main ones, of course, y'all need to work on uh, is the first exam. Uh, the first exam, uh, I think I'm going to give it to you till Saturday to kind of wrap that up and get that, get that wrapped up overall. Uh, first exam, bonus quiz, I'll try to maybe, I'll probably extend that until uh, week nine uh, during uh, midterms coming up. Uh, so that's another thing I'll kind of, if you want extra credit, you know, toward the class, that's an assignment you, you should probably try to do and get that done. Second vocabulary due Friday, but I will kind of leave it open, of course. And then I do have that new British quiz uh, I did post Monday uh, for you to start working on uh, and try to get that done. So that's it for today uh, uh, for this lecture. Uh, like I said, next week I'll have a part two uh, lecture, which will go more into the Napoleonic era uh, that kind of occurs uh, starting at the end of the French Revolution. So I'll kind of uh, get that in week nine. So yeah, we're halfway uh, pretty much over uh, with the semester for this 16-week class uh, at BRCC. Uh, like I said, if you have any comments, questions about, about these lectures, do let me know, of course, on Canvas, or you can also leave uh, me a comment, of course, uh, on my YouTube channel uh, as well. Uh, before I go, I'll kind of show you a video clip, uh, but it's uh, of the French National Anthem, which, uh, as you know, they got rid of that uh, National Anthem, which was uh, the one about King Henry IV. Yeah, they replaced it with, of course, 
uh, the Marcia, uh, which is the one they use now uh, today. But I'll show you a video clip of it, uh, which, of course, is an instrumental version. So y'all take care and have a great fall break, of course, coming up. Thank <laughs> you.